to go to the moon would cost perhaps a hundred thousand dollars a pound the Chinese have announced that they're yeah. going to go to the moon. In fact, they will probably beat the United States. NASA last year admitted that their time frame is behind the Chinese time frame. Something about Michio Waku's face that night unsettled everyone in the room. This was a man millions of people knew from television. The theoretical physicist who could make wormholes, time travel, and parallel universes sound like bedtime stories. He was calm, charming, always quick with a smile. But tonight, on the stage in front of a hall filled with scientists, journalists, and historians, he looked shaken. His hands trembled slightly as he adjusted the microphone. His voice cracked, and his eyes, normally alive with energy, seemed fixed on a single image projected behind him. It was a picture of the moon, our closest neighbor, our cosmic twin. The same pale disk we've gazed at for thousands of years. The same light that guided sailors across oceans, inspired poets and prophets, and pulled the tides of our planet with a rhythm so perfect, it shaped the birth of civilization itself. The evening was supposed to be routine. The latest presentation of data collected from new lunar observation satellites, advanced imaging tools that could see beneath the moon's surface like never before. It was meant to be another incremental update, a scientific footnote in humanity's ongoing exploration of the cosmos. But as the first slide shifted into view, the air inside the room thickened, Conversations died mid-sentence. Pens froze in mid-air. The hum of the projector filled the silence like a low drone. Because what appeared on that screen wasn't just data. It was a confession. A revelation too strange to dismiss, too heavy to ignore. Instead of endless layers of stone, the satellites had uncovered something impossible. Vast hollow chambers stretching beneath the lunar crust. Not random caves, not collapsed lava tubes, these voids were arranged in neat, repeating patterns, some running for hundreds of kilometers. They weren't chaotic fractures, they looked engineered. Then came the thermal readings. Deep within those voids were heat sources. Not random patches of warmth, not volcanic activity. The signatures pulsed, rising and falling at regular intervals, as if controlled by something beneath the surface. Nature doesn't create precision. Nature doesn't beat like a heart. The room shifted in its seats. For the first time, the idea we had dismissed for decades was impossible to ignore. The moon might not be natural, it might not even be a moon at all. And just when everyone thought the revelations had reached their peak, Kaku advanced to the next set of slides. Gravitational maps, compiled from three different space agencies. At first, the images looked like static, random patterns of color and noise. But when the data was layered, a shape emerged, a lattice, a grid, lines of force stretching from pole to pole, wrapping the moon in a perfect geometric skeleton. Every anomaly aligned with the hollow chambers below the surface. Metallic regions, previously dismissed as unusual mineral deposits, were positioned at precise points along the grid. It was no longer possible to explain this away as coincidence. This wasn't chaos, this was order. This was design. If the grid was functional, Kaku warned, then the moon wasn't just a satellite hanging in orbit. It was maintaining its own position, stabilizing the Earth's axis, regulating the tides, acting as a cosmic gyroscope that kept our world balanced, habitable, alive. And if the moon was engineered to do that, then someone or something must have engineered it. The question hung in the air like an electric charge. Who placed it there? And for what purpose? Kaku's voice grew quieter, more solemn, as he left the world of physics behind and turned instead to history. He spoke of the Sumerians, who recorded a time before the moon appeared in the skies. He showed Mayan texts that spoke of gods descending from a glowing disk, bringing knowledge and order. He pointed to Egyptian carvings that depicted the moon as a newcomer, a teacher, a divine messenger. What would it take to make an honest attempt at lunar colonization? This was from Stephen Kellatt. Well, let's be real. To send a pound of anything into orbit, mm -hmm. this orbit costs $10,000 a pound. That is your weight in gold. Mm -hmm. Think of your weight in gold, solid gold, and then that's what it costs <laughs> to put you in orbit. To go to the moon would cost perhaps $100,000 a pound. Yeah. To go to Mars would cost about a million dollars a pound. 
Imagine your body weight in diamonds. That's what it would cost to put you on the planet Mars. Right. Now, by 2020, we're going to have a traffic jam on the moon. The Chinese have announced that yeah. they're going to go to the moon. In fact, they will probably beat the United States. NASA last year admitted that their time frame is behind the Chinese time frame. And the Chinese are doing really well so far with their with their orbiters and getting right. up there. And can there. you imagine all these nations putting flags in the moon yeah. and bumping into each other? I mean, <laughs> me, me. <laughs> Driving around in your little lunar rovers. Me, me. <laughs> right. So you have to realize that it's very expensive. And look, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, that's what most people say, he found riches and wealth in the new world. Yeah because it didn't cost that much. Queen Isabella's a bracelet, apparently, funded uh, Columbus's voyage to the New World. And almost immediately they found the gold, the gold of Montezuma. Mm -hmm. uh, tobacco was a, a cash crop. The moon has no gold. The moon right. has no air. The moon has no, the moon has no water. Mm -hmm. Maybe helium-3 for our fusion machines. Mm -hmm. So I think space colonization, even though I'm all for it, mm -hmm is going to be longer term than we thought. Because, right. well, first of all, we have to leave the Earth. The Earth in five billion years will be destroyed. That's mm -hmm. a law of physics. Mm -hmm. We will have one day, the last nice day on the Earth. The oceans will boil, the mountains will melt, yeah. and we're going to go back into the sun when the sun becomes a red giant. When it starts expanding. That's yes. right. And on a scale of 50 million years, another dinosaur killing cometer asteroid will hit the Earth. Mm -hmm. On a scale of 10,000 years, we're going to be under a half a mile of ice. 10,000 years ago, we were under half a mile of ice. It's going to happen again in 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. So we have to leave the Earth at some point. As Carl Sagan once said, we have to be a two planet species. An insurance policy, two planet species. Mm -hmm. But he also said, what's the rush? <laughs> 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 it costs a lot of money to put men on Mars. It does and, and cost a lot of money. Right. It, so it's a technological and a monetary. I say let's do it with robots. Uh, let's have a permanent robot presence on Mars right. and, and the moon. And then when prices go down, we can then start to put humans up there. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a space elevator could bring down the cost of space travel by a factor of 100. Right. If there, if there are also minerals on the moon that could be mined, maybe robots could go and mine for materials that could be used then but yeah. to build things but and to take But it's easier to simply go to your backyard and mine things. Yeah. <laughs> so it is. For generations, we had explained these myths away we called them legends, stories, metaphors. But when placed beside the new data, they began to sound like memories. Records of something our ancestors saw and tried to preserve in the only way they knew how. Through story and symbol. Even the beauty of eclipses, long celebrated as cosmic theater, suddenly seemed sinister. The moon is positioned with such flawless precision that it perfectly covers the sun down to the fraction of a percent. Astronomers call it coincidence. But how many coincidences can exist before they reveal intention? The evidence kept building. High-frequency tomography revealed reflective materials buried deep in the lunar crust. Metals no one could identify, arranged in patterns, lined up as if by blueprint. When placed under simulated stress, these materials absorbed and redirected force. They behaved like shielding, like the casing of a machine designed to survive. And suddenly, those strange seismic events, the so-called moonquakes, took on new meaning. The Apollo missions had recorded them decades ago. The most famous occurred when NASA deliberately crashed a lunar module into the moon during Apollo 12. The scientists expected a dull thud. Instead, the moon vibrated for nearly an hour. It rang like a bell. At the time, NASA dismissed it as a curiosity, but natural rock doesn't resonate like that, not unless it's hollow, or worse, hollow and reinforced. The idea of a constructed moon sounded absurd, yet the data refused to be ignored, and then came the most disturbing revelation of all. Radio astronomers monitoring the skies had been recording strange bursts of energy for years, low-frequency signals rising from the moon's dark side. At first, scientists assumed interference, background noise. But as more data poured in, a pattern appeared. The bursts weren't random. They came from the same coordinates. They repeated at precise intervals. And when filtered through advanced AI analysis, some of the patterns began to look disturbingly like code. 
sequences, pulses that resembled primitive computer language. Even stranger, the signal spiked whenever spacecraft passed behind the moon, beyond Earth's line of sight. Almost as if something hidden inside the lunar shadow was responding. If the moon is transmitting, then who is it speaking to? And if it's listening, who is it listening for? As the audience shifted nervously in their seats, Kaku delivered one final blow. He reminded everyone that many of the original Apollo mission recordings had vanished. Dozens of tapes, telemetry data, high-frequency astronaut transmissions, even the raw seismic recordings had been mysteriously lost or erased. Some tapes were recorded over, others simply disappeared. The details hidden on those tapes were whispered about in private for decades. Astronauts spoke of seeing strange lights on the far side, of hearing mechanical echoes beneath the surface, of losing communications at the exact moment they orbited behind the moon. Retired insiders hinted at closed-door meetings where astronauts were told to remain silent. We once believed these were just rumors, but now, paired with the new evidence, the silence itself felt like confirmation. And that was the moment when Michiwaku stopped speaking. His slides froze on a final image of the lunar surface. His hand trembled on the podium. And for the first time in his career, the eternal optimist of science lowered his head and cried. The silence in the room was suffocating. Not the silence of awe, but of realization. That everything we thought we knew about our closest neighbor might have been a lie. The moon, once a symbol of love and serenity, now loomed like a cold machine. From hollow chambers to pulsing heat signatures, from ancient myths to erased recordings, from impossible orbits to digital-like signals, each piece of evidence pointed in one direction. The moon might not be natural, it might not be lifeless, and it might not even be ours. So what happens if we dig deeper? What happens if we unlock whatever lies beneath those hollow chambers? What if the moon isn't just watching us, but waiting? That night, Michiwaku left the stage without answering. Maybe he couldn't. Maybe he knew that the truth was bigger than equations, bigger than science, bigger than him. And now the question isn't whether the moon is real or artificial. The question is what its purpose is. A regulator of Earth's balance? A cosmic monument? A beacon to the stars? Or a machine lying dormant, waiting for the right moment to wake up? We've spent our lives staring at the moon, believing it was ours. But what if it was never ours at all? Because sometimes the greatest secrets aren't hidden in distant galaxies. Sometimes they're right above us. So I'll leave you with this. Do you believe the moon is just a rock? Or do you think it's something else entirely? Tell me your thoughts in the comments. And if this left you questioning what we really know about the universe, make sure you subscribe. Because in our next story, we'll uncover a mystery that could change not just how you see the night sky, but how you see reality itself.